Angelina Jolie. Yeah, I heard that. Too, so Welcome, everyone, to the November 10 City Council Work Session. Uh, welcome to our visitors here today, and uh, welcome to folks at home. Um, Councillor uh, Solomon, I don't know if she's going to be joining us by phone, no. but she won't be here in person. Okay. She won't be joining <coughs> us by phone either. And uh, uh, Councillor Zelenka is here now, so we're all here and ready to go. And our um, work session item today is Eugene Water and Electric Board Sale of Water to Vanita. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. And I'll turn it over to uh, Brenda, who will uh, give us a presentation. And just as a reminder, today is just really an information work session that um, our plan would be, unless you direct us otherwise, would be to go from here into a, to uh, scheduling it as a part of a public hearing. And then following a public hearing, we'd be coming back to the council for a work session for some kind of action. At least we would have some sort of a recommendation at that time, and that would occur in January. So. Uh, today's information and Brenda why don't you lead us off all right thank you uh, for the record Brenda Wilson and a governmental relations manager um, as you know uh, in April of this year uh, eWeb and the city of Vanita entered into a contract for the sale of water to of surplus water to Vanita uh, we brought uh, some background information to the City Council shortly thereafter and uh, in May and you directed us to uh, have a joint meeting with eWeb um, to schedule a public forum and uh, to uh, schedule a public hearing the joint meeting was held in uh, June on June 7th the public information forum was presented on June 8th and we held a public hearing on June 14th seven people testified uh, at that public hearing and we also received uh, three written testimony um, on June 28th we brought the issue back to the City Council for some direction and you voted to postpone a decision on the sale of water to Vanita pending the outcome of the uh, validation process uh, we now have uh, a, an initial outcome to that validation process uh, the City of Vanita has asked us to consider the sale of water to, uh, to Vanita the sale of surplus water and several City Councilors have also asked for the option to to weigh in on that so that is what we are doing uh, today is presenting the initial information and bringing that back to you uh, with some suggested next steps and with that I will ask eWeb and Vanita to present that information to you here, I'm just gonna Brenda why don't you stay here Got an extra chair here. Either Rick or Brian. Here, I'll just sit right come on up here. Yeah. Why don't you come over here, Deborah, and we'll work this out. Thank you. We're tag teaming a bit, and I think my uh, my job is to kind of just provide a few. Uh, probably three points that I want to make and really leave the majority of time uh, for Rick to share some information with you and then for uh, us including Brad Taylor who's here to answer any questions that you might have so I just really again have three points I want to make one is that um, you know as we've talked a lot and as Brenda shared and as we've had the opportunity to share with you before here um, securing at least a portion of that third water right we feel is a really important and critical piece for this community and we feel it's important on a number of fronts we feel it has economic development opportunities associated with it. Having a wonderful and adequate abundant supply of water is important to this community. And we feel like it provides important protection against what the, the growing belief that we have an uncertain climate future. So, so I, I just want to, I think that that's our message. That's what we've brought and talked to you about in the past. And I don't think that's changed for us at all. We feel really strongly about that. Um, the second point is that I wanted to thank all of you, and I think we were able to meet with Roger and I. We didn't meet with you, Mike. I don't believe you were available. Um, and Alan, we weren't able to meet with you in our uh, kind of one-on-one, -on -one, but we did have an opportunity. I think Roger had an opportunity to talk with you at our major customer event. So we really appreciated the chance to talk with all of you. And, and no, number one, provide an opportunity for you to maybe get to know Roger, our new general manager, just a bit. But also, and, and perhaps more importantly, to talk about our growing sense that um, a regional water strategy um, 
is an important and, and, and critical way for us as a community to manage the cost of a current risk. And that current risk, as we shared with you, is around EWEB's single source, the Mackenzie Water, the Mackenzie River, as our single source of drinking water. Uh, the unique situation we're in, in terms of it being a municipal utility of our size and not having a backup source, and the opportunity that partnering with neighboring utilities and with our regional partners might have to enable the city of Eugene to mitigate that risk in a way that's considerably more cost effective. And I think all of you, uh, who we met with received a copy of a handout that I think looked at a uh, relative cost of a second or a new plant um, with a different source um, in the hundred plus million dollar range versus you know the potential of a shared uh, vision being something considerably less expensive and so that's important to us we continue to work hard to find a way in our own capital planning to find a home for that large expense and it's a large expense no matter no matter which scenario you go down but uh, really critical um, and so third you know I guess going from there is the notion that the engineering that's associated with making that kind of a shared strategy work is relatively simple. Brad's probably laughing at me. He probably doesn't think it's nearly as simple as I might make it out to be. But it's, it, but it's uh, the interconnections that might happen are relatively civil, simple civil engineering types of issues. The complex piece of the work is in the relationships and the building of relationships between the various entities that might choose to partner in a strategy. And so while we recognize and I think we've shared with you that the Veneta contract feels a bit out of order in terms of the magnitude of the contract relative to the size of the water source that we're looking to protect, um, the the work that we're doing collaboratively, and I do view this today as a continuation of that collaborative process, the work that we're doing collaboratively is an important piece in demonstrating that as a community we're interested in at least pursuing that option. So um, it's a tough spot for Vinny to be in, and we're thankful and so appreciative of your willingness to consider uh, looking at the Vanita contract in some way differently so that we can allow Vanita to move forward with their plans while we continue to work on clarifying our own uh, mutual authorities. So I think really that's what I had to offer today, and, and I think Rick probably has the more interesting information to share. Yeah, thank you, uh, Rick Ingham, uh, City Administrator for City of Benita. First of all, uh, we need to express our thanks to Mayor Piercy and to Mr. Reese for bringing this back before the council. Uh, I don't think this is a little out of sequence of what maybe what was proposed several months ago. And so uh, it is to Venita a very time sensitive issue. And so we do appreciate both uh, council members and management team uh, uh, willingness to bring this forward. Uh, it, it's time sensitive kind of from two standpoints. One is we did receive an acknowledgement that we are eligible for our grant and loan package. Uh, that rural development funding package is um, has a perishable time period on it. Uh, it will expire on August of 2015. Uh, they are federal ARA funds and so they're pretty clear that if the project is not completed and funds drawn and all the environmental stuff completed by that 2015 date, we are not eligible to draw on the funds. Now, that seems like a long time out, but at this point, our preliminary engineering has that project taking up to four years to build. Um, we have the engineering in itself is 10 to 12 months. The uh, additional permitting and uh, the follow-up work that's already been done to the preliminary engineering report will take a period of time. Going out for construction bids and then, of course, to actually build it, the preliminary estimate is up to 24 months. Now, we think it can be done sooner than that. So as we, we're really not in a situation to wait for an appeal process to be played out. Uh, we really do need to act on that. The second one uh, that we feel uh, is less important but equally, um, it's a $17.1 million project. Currently, it's scheduled that our residents will incur about $13.1 million in new debt service. And uh, what we have found through some current projects is most of our capital activities are coming in anywhere from 15 to 30% under budget. And if we could reduce uh, $13 million 
or I should say reduce 10, 15, 20 percent off of that capital project, that's uh, huge when it comes to the amount of rates that we'll have to pass along to our ratepayers. And so we are anxious to still try to capture the current uh, bidding climate and try to move forward with this project. Now, having said that, we're at least a year out or a year and a half out having to complete this process, uh, go through final engineering, bid the project, and actually award it. And so, but, but we do think, unfortunately, that the, the economy is not going to get revved up in the next 12 to 18 months. It is a huge project, and it will be not on the magnitude of a $100 million construction project that eWeb talks about for water improvements, but a $15 million construction project in the Eugene Springfield metro area is a big job producer, and it will be one of the larger infrastructure projects being done at that time. So, the, you know, our urgency is really around trying to still capture this relatively good fitting climate. Um, I don't want to go into it. I, Brian Issa, our community service director, is here to go through kind of the technical recap that we've done in the last three to four months that have really just pointed us down this road that have all the all the alternative analysis, all the engineering work, there's, it's pretty clear why we need to pursue uh, the pipeline project as our preferred, if really our only alternative, and I'll, I'll have them go into that in some detail. I think the counselors have received two kind of project overviews over the last uh, three to four months. Hopefully those have been helpful. Don't really want to go into those in any great detail. Kind of the, the real quick one though is we are a young city. We are still developing a lot of our major infrastructure. Uh, we were founded as a city in 62 because of water quality and water quantity issues. Uh, there was E. coli and nitrates in the groundwater source. That's basically why our founding fathers came together and, and incorporated. <coughs> uh, we continue to struggle and we continue to put a lot of staff time and a, a greater proportion of our resources into ensuring that we have viable potable drinking sources for our residents, uh, probably more so than just about any community in the southern Willamette Valley. I mean, said that is we do not have access to good aquifers out there, and I think some of that preliminary information is kind of pointing to why that is. We also don't have access to surface water sources as most of the other communities in the southern Willamette Valley have. And so a lot of those drive up some of those overall costs. Uh, Having said that, we are no different than any other community. We are mandated under goal 14 to have a 20 year supply of drinking water, have the infrastructure in place to meet the population projection that's been handed down to Venita. So I know that there will probably be some questions about growth, but this issue is really about meeting that goal 14 requirement and having the necessary infrastructure in place. Really the source of our drinking water in Benita staff's opinion and our elected officials' opinion will not drive our growth rate one way or the other. Um, we've, we've been given a population number. That's the number that we're trying to achieve. So um, there's been a bulk of work done in the last 16 months. We've had a new water master plan that's kind of laid out the background, why it's important, what are the alternatives for us. We've had extensive well-filled evaluation work done to try to <coughs> determine is there an actually an aquifer there that exists. And then more importantly, as part of the application for the rural development uh, uh, grant and loan package, we did complete a preliminary engineering report. The bulk of all those three reports clearly point to us that the pipeline project is the preferred alternative, if not the low cost alternative. And so if I can, I'm going to have uh, Brian Issa, uh, who has really been project lead for the last 12 months on this. He's going to hand out a PowerPoint, or I'll let him come up. I'll hand out the PowerPoint and then be available for questions. So, great. <coughs> Just make sure I have a copy of the PowerPoint right here. There I do. Hello, Brian Issa, Community Services Director Welcome. for the City of Anita. And Rick's going to hand out here a PowerPoint, which is essentially uh, an adaptation of a presentation that we gave to our city council as we started talking about the pipeline project, especially from the <coughs> point of view of what were the impacts going to be on our rate pair. So as you get into the end of this, there is actually, it's a little heavy on some of the rate information. Uh, there might be a little too much information in there. Um, but just to touch on a few things that Rick had pointed to, um, really water is the salient issue in the city of Anita. When I arrived there in 2004, um, during the summer seasons, the first question out of everybody's mouth every day was, how's the tank doing? 
we were in the situation of going to the public works yard and looking at the level meter on the tank to see if we had enough water. Uh, we didn't get to the point of having to do mandatory curtailments or get really draconian in terms of conservation measures, um, but we were right at the cusp um, pretty much throughout the, the high demand season. And we've spent a whole lot of money between here and there trying to get at more water. So this presentation will touch on some of those efforts and how some of them have come to fruition and how some of them have not. Um, so just going over the purpose here, uh, it is to discuss our water situation in the city of Venita. It will give you a brief overview of the potential costs of necessary water improvements, both on the pipeline side and as a comparison, um, future well development scenarios. And we'll actually go through two development scenarios for groundwater production. Um, and to give the Eugene City Council an idea of potential rate and SDC impacts to the city of Venita and our rate payers under both all those scenarios and to aid the council in their deliberations uh, on the wholesale water agreement and whether or not to approve an agreement with the city of Veneta. Uh, we will go over demand projections, uh, some of our existing supplies, options for future development and a comparison of optimistic and conservative scenarios, so both a, a best case scenario and a worst case scenario in terms of well field development <coughs> and we'll talk a little bit about why we have we started out with a little more optimistic scenario, which when I say optimistic is a little, it's a little optimistic to say optimistic. <laughs> um, but you try to look for words that aren't pessimistic or, you know, worst case scenario. So we, we've called them the optimistic and the conservative scenarios. Um, so the page that you have here, and I apologize, there's a page numbers, maybe a faux pas, but the one with the graph, the first one with the graph is really an overview of the population and demand projections for the city of Venita um, through 2030 and, and through build out, which is not much beyond 2030 for the city. Um, our 2030 population of 96, a little over 9,600 people is as handed down from the county during the coordinated population process that worked itself out over the last couple of years. Um, the average day demand projections there and maximum day demand projections one of the key things to note is that as you go down through average day demand, when you get to 1.6 there at 2030, that is our current production capacity. So we do have existing capacity to handle our average day demand through 2030, um, given these, these population projections. So really the key is the maximum day demand projections. And they're far in excess of average day demand. And it's essentially irrigation. It's a, it's a, it's a large spike in water usage throughout the city. Um, uh, the current eWeb agreement is for a maximum of 4 MGD, so that would cover just about our maximum day demand um, as we move through the year 2030. And the pipeline is designed to handle a, a flow of at least 4 MGD. What does build out mean? Uh, build out would be full build out of the UGB at projected densities. Um, so it's a little bit beyond the, the 20 year planning horizon. Our current UGB has enough land at, at projected densities to handle not only the 2030, so that 20 year planning horizon, but a, a little bit beyond that. <coughs> the next graph where it says projected demand versus current supply really gives you an idea <coughs> of where we are in terms of well development. So <coughs> the sort of dashed red line there is all of our current wells and our existing capacity, which sits at about 1.6 MGD. The dotted blue line that goes across the top there is projected demand, so you can see the gap between those two. Now, given that our growth rates haven't materialized as quickly in the near term as, as projected, that line is probably a little, a little shallower in the near term, but population projections being what they are, you expect fluctuations in the growth rate, but overall over 20 years, you'll probably end up in the same spot. So we, we still take that as a, as a, valid, a valid assumption. And you know, really the key for me in the city of Venita here is, is that gap between what is our current supply and what is our projected demand. Um, our average day demand, again, is, is really below or, or in line with uh, what our capacity is, our production capacity. Um, so where it says irrigation demand, that's the difference between average day demand, so winter use, in-home use, and irrigation on the other side. And we do have a very aggressive conservation program in the city of Benita. Um, we even go as far as going door-to-door -door, um, and talking to our high-end users 
about water, you know, water conservation. We have rebate programs, etc. But really, you're not going to close that gap with conservation. Um, at best, with even pretty draconian conservation measures, if you get to 10 percent uh, shave off that peak, you're doing really, really well, and that's putting a lot of money into education and outreach. So, you know, we're definitely putting a lot of money and a lot of time to the conservation angle of things. We want to use our existing sources and future sources as efficiently as possible, um, but we're not going to close that entire gap of conservation. So that leaves us looking for new supplies. Uh, the map of the city here that has the, the wells on it gives you an idea of where our existing wells are in relation to the UGB, the red line being the UGB. Um, we have five wells currently under production. The only one that really puts out a, a really significant output for us is well nine. That's really our workhorse well at 550 gallons a minute. The ones to the north there, well 10 and 11, really at this point those wells are non-operational. We don't even pump those wells. The quality that comes out of those wells is very, very high in iron, so it's very expensive to treat and remove all that iron and deal with it and the gallons per minute production out of those wells was nowhere near what was estimated when they were under undergone the 24-hour pump test initially. Um, they just aren't very cost effective for us to run those wells, but they are indicative of the types of wells that we see when we, we put holes in the ground in the Bonita area. You do deal with high concentrations of iron and fairly low yields in terms of, of production from the wells in the area. So well nine is really kind of the anomaly. If we could hit two or three more well nines <coughs> at 550 gallons a minute, that would be great. Um, but everything that we're seeing in terms of the geology and existing well logs is saying it's probably not going to happen. Um, we also have wells, uh, several wells beyond these that have been abandoned in the past either for quality or quantity issues. Um, the next one, the really colorful map there. Um, we had GSI Water Solutions out of Corvallis go through a pretty detailed geological survey out there looking at soils, looking at existing well logs, plotting those out and modeling those um, to determine where the most likely water bearing strata are in the Veneta area based on existing well logs. So really the bluer you see on the map there, the more likely there is to be water. That's kind of an oversimplification of the whole thing, but that's, that's basically what you get at. Um, so you see centered around the well nine area, a nice area of blue, and then trending mostly towards the northeast is where those pockets of, of water are most likely to be. The next map essentially shows you the same thing, it just has our, <coughs> our existing wells overlaying on the, the same thing. So well nine is right in the middle of the blue area, which is partly because well nine's information influences the model, but there are other wells in that area as well. So. Um, now, one critical factor that happened here is, is at about the same time that we had GSI doing this work to figure out where we should go to drill, this was really intended to guide future e exploration. Where should we put holes in the ground to find more water? Um, so what they came up with is really go to the east side of the UGB and potentially outside of the UGB, north and northeast of the city. At a, pretty much the same time, we were trying to secure water rights for well 12, which is a new, our newest well inside the Benita Public Works Yard. The determination that came down from the Department of Water Resources during that evaluation of water rights for well 12 was that there is an assumed hydraulic connection between any well within one mile of the Long Tom or Fern Ridge Reservoir. Um, that had huge impacts for us. Because there are no existing water rights uh, to be allocated in Fern Ridge or the Long Tom, a hydraulic link between our groundwater and that surface water essentially means that if we pull water out of the ground, we're infringing on somebody else's water rights. So that, that had a huge impact for us. Essentially, it limited withdrawals from all new wells within that one mile buffer to a total of 143 gallons a minute. So yes, we can continue to drill wells within that buffer area, but we're going to be limited to 143 gallons per minute regardless of the production <coughs> capacity of the well. So. Even if we hit another well nine, we can only pump it at 143 gallons a minute. And potentially even more severe limitations during the peak withdrawal months, which is when we need the water. So this map with the, the dark cloud on the horizon <laughs> there is really that same you know, water potential map with 
the overlay area from the Long Tom River and Fernridge Reservoir. Mm -hmm. So we had one group of geologists and hydrologists telling us that's where all the water is, and we had the State Department of Water Resources telling us you can yeah. go look anywhere but over there. <laughs> um, so that changes the picture considerably for us, and we know beyond this model, just through uh, anecdotal accounts and, and other well logs, that as you go to the south and southeast of the city, water gets harder and harder to find. Uh, anybody who lives out in the Crow area knows there's not a whole lot of water out there. And the water you do find has some serious quality problems a lot of times. And there are even quality problems that we don't deal with inside the city. So beyond iron, there's arsenic. There's, there's other heavy metal issues out there. So <coughs> what that did for us is, and I think this is actually a little bit out of order here. Um, Let's skip over the one that says long range alternatives there and go to the one that says impacts of ODWR determination. So, the impacts of that determination were essentially decreased well yields. So, whether we drill within that area and are limited or we drill outside of that area where there's less likely to be high yielding wells, uh, we're probably going to get less gallons per dollar invested in well development. Um, you also get more potential interference with municipal and agricultural and residential wells as you move out into that area. And most importantly probably is that as the distance to our existing treatment facilities increases as we go south, southeast, um, all of your treatment and piping costs increase dramatically. So you start to go to set additional satellite treatment facilities versus it being more cost effective to pipe it to a centralized facility, which increases your cost. So because the amount of water you can potentially get is going down and the cost of that development is going up, the cost per gallon essentially is going to go up drastically under that scenario. So the one that says groundwater scenarios with the two columns, optimistic and conservative. Um, really lay out two different scenarios. The Where it says yield 200 gallons a minute. Our water master plan was completed in 2008, 2009 under the assumption that we could find wells that would yield on average 200 gallons a minute. Um, the Department of Water Resources determination and the work that GSI did beyond that has really said you're more likely to see 100 gallons a minute as, as a well yield. So that's a, that's a more conservative estimate of well yield. And what it does is it kicks the cost of well development out to 2030 up from 1.95 million to 2.97 million per well. And it also increases the number of wells that you need because you're getting less water from each well. So instead of drilling 10 wells to meet our demand out to 2030, we're looking at drilling 19. It's half the production, twice the number of wells. Um, and those don't include in another 8 to 9 million in non-source related improvements, so storage and fire flow related. Um, so that, that's sort of the two well development scenarios encapsulated right there. And you're seeing it going from 20 million to 56 million. Um, that just gets you 10 years down the road. Now, to compare that with the pipeline, the next page sort of encapsulates the, the cost when it comes to those two compared to the pipeline. You have the opti optimistic well scenario at 19, conservative wells, worst case scenario at, at 56, and then the pipeline coming in at 17.1. The problem with the pipeline is all front loaded costs to the city, so our, our rate payers do see that impact up front versus being parceled out over time as growth happens, um, but it's a guaranteed supply guaranteed supply and that's you can't emphasize that enough so you don't have to worry about it anymore which, which is huge so you can see that in terms of just costs in general the pipeline at this point according to the analysis that we've done does come out as the the low cost scenario and, and it is the guaranteed supply um, that being said it has huge huge impacts on our rates and our SDCs. The next two pages, and there's a lot of numbers here, we won't get into all of them, but it has the pipeline and both well scenarios um, scheduled out in terms of total percent increase to our rates, and then a comparison of the SDCs at the bottom. So we are looking at anywhere, and these numbers were the first rough cut, 30,000 foot view at what this would do to our rates. 
Um, we have refined this a little bit since then, but we are looking at a 100 plus percent increase to our rates, regardless of which scenario we go with. Um, but you can see there that the, the pipeline does come in in terms of rate impacts with a much lower impact to our rate payers in general than, than would either of the well development scenarios. Um, similarly, on the SDC side, the pipeline sits about in the middle of the SDC comparison. And this is, it's a little technical, but this is assuming 33% of the pipeline is expensed to SDCs versus to the rate payers on a month to month basis. Um, so this is kind of, this this is the pessimistic growth scenario, I guess. <coughs> the next one is ex where it says expense to 100% to SCCs. This says this is basically for growth. We're going to expense it all to growth. Um, if you've dealt with SCCs and rates much, that's probably an over optimistic assumption that you're going to be able to incorporate all of this into your SCCs and get it paid back through growth. Um, but even if you did, the impacts on the rate are, are still significant, up 82% for the pipeline and then over 150% for either of the well scenarios. And so still the pipeline comes out as, as the most cost effective for us. No matter how we move the money around, either SDCs or rates, um, the pipeline does seem to come out as, as the best case scenario for us. Um, the next one is just a a view of the rates that says the same thing the previous table did. And then that is pretty much it. I've got a sheet there that you guys don't. And then do you have a, yeah, that's the scary graph. I don't like that graph at all. You never like graphs where the bar goes off the page. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Especially when it's your city with the bar going off the page. Mm -hmm. um, but what that shows you is that we would, um, under, <laughs> even under the, under the worst case scenario, we would have the highest cumulative SDC in the state, according to these numbers. And these are 2008, 2007 league numbers. They just did a new survey, so I'm waiting for the new numbers to come out. Um, you never know how you compare. It's, it's kind of disingenuous to compare with other cities on SDCs because you don't know how often they've, in they've actually done the review mm -hmm. and, and increased their SDCs. But we would definitely move from the middle of the pack to the the far end of the pack. So there's a there's a lot of political implications mm -hmm. for for the city here. <coughs> but I guess what I want you to take away from what we'd like you to take away from all of this is is that we have done our homework. I think with the ARA funding, sometimes there's the assumption that because the federal government threw out a big chunk of money, that that people <coughs> sort of make up projects to use the money. Um, I, that's not the case with the city of Anita. We've been thinking about water nonstop for since before I was there in 2004. Um, we completed the water master plan prior to the R funding being available. That water master plan says you should keep drilling wells, but you're not going to be able to meet your long-term needs from wells. We did the geological work that said <coughs> there's probably not enough water out there. Um, so when the R funds did come along, really that was, it, it was the, very timely for us that we were able to, to seize those funds. So, is there anything else that... No, I think we just open it up for questions. Okay, everybody. Anything else you want to say, Brenda? Uh, no, I'll wait till the end. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike, you're first. I, forgive me, Rick. I don't know a lot about the uh, financing in the, in the uh, city of Anita, but I, I don't know, do you have... Uh, uh, outstanding city bonds of any degree at the moment? Do you have a number of them out at this moment? Uh, we did. Uh, we did take out uh, some uh, rural development financing back in '98 for the expansion of our wastewater plant, and then uh, really all the water improvements that have been made to the city in the last 20 years. We've been fortunate. We've actually taken out of urban renewal, oh. and those uh, increases have not been really passed on to our ratepayers. Well, I just wondered. Uh, what the effect on your bond rating is of having such a water problem <coughs> and what it costs the people in Benita because of that. But right. Yeah, uh, I mean, at this point, because of the analysis that rural development has done and it's a 40 year debt service, I, I would yeah. think that we wouldn't have any pushback on what our bond rating would be. Uh, yeah. I mean. Thank you. Sure. Okay, Andrea? Well, I just want to check with Glenn. Is there anything that we shouldn't ask? 
Okay. <laughs> just wanted to make sure before. Um, there are no legal constraints on what you ask. Okay. <laughs> Whether I get an answer or not. There may so. be other constraints, is what he's saying, but they're not legal. Yeah. Okay. So, I'm sorry, what was that, Mayor? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So, I guess I'm just going to get down. I mean, I really um, thank you for coming and sharing with mm -hmm. us to begin with, and thanks, Deb, for the background. I'm, you know, I'm Mayor. all for wanting to step forward with this, but I have some concerns about about other l charter issues, and so that and that really isn't part of this conversation, you know, that we're having here at the table. But I'm just curious, what is the amount of water that you absolutely need? Well, as Brian's uh, graph showed, I mean, we actually have uh, water to meet our average daily demand looking out 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, probably looking out two or three years, we do not have a current water source to meet our peak daily demand. Okay. And so really, we, either we move forward with the pipeline project with the thought that we can turn this that spigot on in five years, mm -hmm. or we'll probably be out building and constructing new wells in three to four years. So the number that we were given, or that has been talked about, was four million? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if, if we were to say less, how would that impact your ability to get the funds or uh, more. At, at this point and there's probably a lot of technical questions there but at this point the engineering analysis and in rural development's eyes the project has been sized and has been engineered for that three to five million size and scope and so if the agreement that came out of Eugene uh -huh. was three uh -huh. million that is going to meet our peak daily demand looking out uh, at least 12 to 15 years maybe as much as 18 years okay. or Great. five um, so, and I just want to say that, anecdotally speaking, with SDCs this high, <laughs> I don't know who's going to want to build in your community there's, down the road. There's a little bit of a pushback with that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, just, just, you know, just. I mean, and it's important to note. I mean, we, the, Vanita has done a lot. We've brought on a new 28-acre industrial and commercial park. Uh, we continue to work with ODOT on 126 improvements. I mean, our, our push is trying to create local jobs for our local residents. Mm -hmm. And if we have any concern about this, it's not the impact on residential development, but how it will impact our goals when it comes to business development activities. Okay. That's all. Thank you. Okay. George Poling. Well, thank you both for the presentation, well, all three of you. Um, very well done. Uh, obviously, the city of Anita has, has done its homework and probably under a lot of pressure to do it and do it properly. And I think it's is pretty well documented of, of the need, uh, you know, and from here I don't know, um, you know, what you're going to do if this, if you can't do this sale because of the restrictions that the um, uh, Department of uh, Water Resources have put on you as far as being able to, uh, with the Long Tom and, and, and uh, Fern Ridge and that, with that one graphic uh, slide with the black cloud has, has <laughs> a real concern. I mean, the only place the water is available, like you said, that you can't drill for it. So I, you know, I'm hopeful that we will at least move this on to a public hearing on this, at minimum, just for the sake of, of uh, continuing to build partnerships and collaboration, which you guys have entered into from the very start of this project. Um, you know, to not let it go to a public hearing, I would be. A, I think it'd be a great disservice to not only the people that live out in Vanita, but to the people that live here in Eugene. Um, you know, it's all about being good neighbors and good partners, and I think that's. This is a good example where I think we need to step up and at least make an effort to to move one step closer to to trying to come up with a solution. Um, you know, if the sale of water from the from Eweb in the city of Eugene doesn't go through. What's your next move? What are you going to do? Well, we go back to the master plan. And the master <laughs> plan basically said you can limp along with a few wells for a few years, and then you need an alternative source. And uh, that alternative source, if it's not the pipeline, is to probably begin a congressional effort, in which whether we would be successful or not, to be able to draw from the reservoir. Uh, you look around the room, and the experts in Burn Ridge the, Reservoir. The likelihood of getting through the con congressional obstacles are probably not very high. And then the other issue is how do you filter and turn that into drinkable water. And the third issue is if, and we know that droughts, global warming, the reservoir may not fill up some years, and so you may not even have it available. And our big issue is that we have enough water. It's like every other community. It's how do you deal with that peak demand in June, July, and August. 
Yeah, well, that really worries me because I've water skied at Fern Ridge, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I've seen what it does to the side of a boat and with just oh one God. one you know one out, outing one afternoon outing, and I've also seen years where you could just about walk all the way across Fern Ridge because, like I said, because of the droughts. <coughs> so that that really concerns me on on tapping into Fern Ridge. It, there, uh, I mean, while we do have the long tom within a fairly short distance, there is no way to go and secure additional water rights. And mm -hmm. most of you have seen the water quality coming down the long tom. It's not a very preferred location to try to draw water from. Um, Thank you. Chris, you're next. Um, thanks. Um, uh, actually, I, I, I want to agree with a lot of the things that George said. Um, I really appreciate your being here, and I appreciate um, your willingness to consider that we've got your questions and other questions and and I'm pleased with the degree to which we've been able to approach those questions now in a little bit of a of a distinctive turn um, because I didn't want you to get caught up in other issues and have you be stalled while we try to work out other issues and hopefully to some degree we can find some resolution to that um, with regard to uh, the, uh, this whole question I think of it now uh, what are the pros what are the cons what are the what are the benefits what are the liabilities um, one liability which people might be concerned about well does you giving water to you somehow hurt Eugene's ability to have water or pump water or, or use water a couple of things this is actually perfecting the water right which we've talked about before which actually makes wa more water available if if needed a second one is that if for some reason um, the earth should shift on its axis or something and we suddenly need that water this contract is terminatable boom it's done and I feel sorry for you but if, if Eugene had to protect itself we could do that so it's not like we're putting ourselves at risk um, and I agree with George about the idea that um, if we have the water available we can perfect the water right at the same time uh, and and help out a neighbor without putting any risk at ourselves um, seems like a, a reasonable thing to do I mean your interests are our interests we're all kind of in this together um, especially if there's no risk to us at the same time I really do want to work out the questions with regard to eWeb and the city and it's nice that we have kind of now we can talk about those as you know in a, to a certain degree as two separate conversations um, and for that reason I agree I think we should move this forward to a public hearing um, mm. I would like to give you the certainty as much as we possibly can um, because uh, I've not yet identified a real downside to us doing this. There may be others that, are, that other folks can, can articulate, but to me, the fact that we can sever the contract if we need to, the water is available, in fact, it helps perfect a water right, um, are, are upsides to me at this point. Okay, Alan, you next. Uh, well done presentation, both of you. Here, very professional and very <laughs> informative. Um, uh, for me, the issues around this don't have anything to do with Finita. Um, <laughs> Uh, although you have no good solutions uh, and good luck with any of them, um, kind of begs the question if all this will work, especially given your SDC graph. I mean, w w if you, you have to pay for this stuff either through SDCs or, or rate increases, and the combination of both may put you in a circumstance where it doesn't work very well. Um, to clarify, the Vinita contract does not secure the water right for EWEB. Um, it, 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 it uh, uh, only gets us a little bit further down the road, and I'll address that in a second. But uh, and and to address the other point you had, I think that having a policy that has uh, gives, says to Venita, go spend a whole bunch of money, put your entire system at risk, and by the way, we might call this back someday, is politically very unrealistic, and untenable, and uh, at, at the very least, it's bad public policy. I think that that I think that if we're going to do this to Venita, it should be more or less a permanent deal. Calling back after they've invested all this money and, and then putting them, sell, putting them back into this circumstance, I think, isn't even going to come close to happening if we should ever pull that trigger. So um, really w why I'm skeptical and what I need more information about is, is uh, related to the city and to EWEP. Um, I think it's very important for us to preserve our water right, uh, although the, no the, existing, the new water right would get us 
well past 2050, and there's no one in line behind us of significance, so I'm not sure what the rush is. Um, it, it's more about our policies and our plans, and specifically concerns about our regional planning and consistency with our land use laws and, and, and our own growth management policies, which we conveniently have up on, on, the, on the wall there. Uh, I asked before and didn't get any response to, and I, and I hope that I can this time, how this whole thing and the regional water uh, you have become a regional water provider is consistent with policies one, two, five, and ten, which talk about provision of urban services and densification and, and um, cooperation with our partners in, in the metro area, um, and 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 transportation efficient land use patterns. So, I'd like to see how some consistency findings for that, and 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 also. Uh, land use goal goal 11 which talks about efficient provision of urban services I think that one is going to be extremely uh, important as these appeals play out and uh, over and uh, especially at Luba and the reason we have all these plans and all this stuff is because um, we need to not wink and nod at them when it's inconvenient but to actually address them and see if we are consistent talk about them decide if it's if there's an, an important acceptance to this for good reason so I'd like to see that analysis and I'll need a round two okay. uh, George Brown thank you um, yeah this I mean much as I sympathize with uh, Anita's problems it's um, mm. this was originally presented to us as a absolute necessity so that we could perfect our third water right uh, on the Mackenzie which which is 118 million gallons a day we're currently using 3% of that third water right with the addition which is about three and a half million gallons a day if, if we added the capacity for Venita's four million gallons a day that's seven and a half million gallons a day to, to really perfect that 118 million gallons we need to use or show that we're going to use 25 percent of it within a reasonable amount of time 25 percent of that is 29 and a half million gallons a day if Heinex came back or a plant like Heinex and came back and occupied that vacant factory and used two million gallons a day like Heinex did that puts us up to nine and a half million gallons a day that's not even a th we're not even a third of the way there so this really doesn't help very much towards perfecting that water right because we're still a long ways away from doing so so what this begs the question now okay now all of a sudden do we the city council regardless of how the, any appeal might turn out do we do we want to become the regional water suppliers for southern lane county because we're going to need a lot more than Benita. we're going to need Coburg we're going to need Creswell we're going to need Junction City I don't know what Elmira's situation is all these other towns we have heard anecdotally through all these meetings that they're in a, going to be in the same position the only way they can grow is if they buy water from us so do we want to do that or do we want to go well you know maybe we don't really need a, this third water right maybe it doesn't need to be that big because if we perfected the whole thing and used it all I calculated that you know with water conservation and everything that's good for a million people do we want Eugene and do we want what I'm saying is <laughs> there's a reason that the council in 1976 when they amended the charter their discussions in the meetings and their instructions to the voters in the voters pamphlet said this is all about controlling growth the council's going to control the extension of water rights it's all about controlling growth and preventing sprawl they had it exactly right they presented it uh, very honestly to the voters the voters responded and they passed the ordinance change so you know Venita is basically a bedroom community for Eugene 90% of the working population works in Eugene which means they drive in this is from one of our earlier meetings that means they drive in 126 and West 11th what do we get out of it I mean George, you know another round yes please daddy okay first I, a couple of problems um, in the AIS it says we're going to have a resolution have a consider a resolution for support we could also consider denial Right, and that didn't give another choice. And then Deborah, about your saying, um, 
we should get it's risky for us to have a single source well but Vanita does nothing for our single source we should be talking to Springfield or thinking of other things if we're concerned about the single source that's just irrelevant to this discussion and as for Vanita you did a good job of convincing people, residents of Vanita I'm sure I mean from your point of view this is a good thing but I'm, I want to hear objections. I want to know what it does to the environment, what it does to long-range planning, what it does to appeals from all the other little towns, as George mentioned, and whether there, there, I'm sure there are some. We should look at it. It's good to help our neighbor, but also we should. We're here to protect our own community and to protect the environment. And I don't know what this this pipeline is going to do. Either, and I do think, sure, you have the money available, and I, I know that's not the only reason, but that's been used as an argument. The money is available now, so we should do it. And I have a question. This is maybe an ignorant question, but that's what questions are sometimes. Uh, have you considered cisterns, a system of cisterns? So we get a lot of rain in the winter time. Um. I'm sure that we asked that question to our engineers, mm -hmm. but to capture the the millions of gallons of, that we would need for peak demand uh, really takes some sort of uh, impound. You almost have to build a dam to go ahead and do so. Uh, to the thought that you could capture that through uh, rain gardens or rain barrels uh, to meet your vegetable needs in July and August when you haven't had any rain for maybe 60 days or 90 days. Um, the, the numbers have been crunched, and it's just that there's no way to actually feasibly do that. It would cost more than uh, the pipeline? Um, I'm not sure we would have enough space mm -hmm. to do that. It would be... I remember when everybody had cisterns. You had a w well, maybe if you were lucky, but you also had a cistern to catch the rainwater. And In this I situation, I guess it would be cisterns that would allow people to have bulk water brought in their cisterns filled up and then you know they would live off that cistern system for a month or two months before additional bulk water was brought back in and refilled so. it seems like another possible solution to me and mm -hmm. i just wondered if it had been considered so but, mm. but i'll be waiting to hear from people who have legitimate objections and mm -hmm. I, I am willing to have a hearing and i do think I, of course, we don't know right now whether it's our decision or not, but I do think it should be. And if it is, I will be listening to both sides. Thank you. Uh, Deborah, I wondered if you had any uh, comments to make about the uh, perfection. Uh, yeah, issue. thank you. Um, you're absolutely right, Councilor Taylor. I mean, and and the the drawing that we shared with you we talked about Vanita being this one community and that was really what I meant in my comment when I said we're a bit, we're a bit out of order with Vanita because they represent admittedly a, a small uh, a small user and the what's of interest and in what we're noticing right now is is that a lot of folks are looking at them and I think uh, our general manager Roger spoke about um, having conversations with other neighboring utilities and community partners um, about participating in a second source shared backup plan and and you're absolutely right it does require involvement from the, the big players and not you know just a city of Vanita so um, I think what what we believe is true is that you, I mean, quite honestly, and I think we said this to each of you individually, um, there's a lot of folks watching to see whether we're able to find a way to help Vanita um, move forward with, with their planning, and that's um, indicative in some way of how willing we as a community are to engage in a different approach. So um, I just want to make a couple comments here. and. Um, one is that I can, I actually feel pretty strongly about the need to um, secure water for the future. Um, so that perfection issue is, uh, seems important to me. Um, we can talk about how much we have now, but I think the unpredictability of the future is a pretty, um, pretty big issue. So I am concerned about that. Um, 
the Benita decision, of it seems to, to me for us, is um, they exist. Uh, they are here now with this problem. This is not a future problem. This is a current problem. Mm -hmm. So where we may have some serious thoughts about growth and development and what we want to happen and what we don't want to happen, they do have a current existing water issue for the people who live there now. And um, so for council, to me, it seems like this is an issue um, in one context, it's an issue about what currently exists for Venita and what our what we're willing or not willing to do about that. Separate from that, and really importantly, I do think is this broader issue, which we're having a hard time dealing with Venita when we don't have a position on the broader issue, which is we have to recognize that, as Betty said and as George said and others, these other communities are going to have water issues. Too. And so there is a broader, what's the future out there? What do we mm. want to try to have happen or not have happen? Regional discussion that really needs a very difficult one, I think, about uh, because I think it's so, if I lived in any of those small communities, I would certainly feel it was personal. <laughs> it's, uh, so it's hard to have this discussion, as many of these types of discussions are, without it feeling very personal when you're really trying to make a good um, land use kind of decision about our our regional future but I do think it's imperative that we have this um, this broader discussion I think it fits into envision Eugene I think it fits into uh, the things that we're currently about in terms of uh, uh, of the future of this whole area so for me I, I'm just wrestling with the uh, how do we deal with what Vanita is facing right this moment how do we set ourselves up to address the regional and when should that happen and how should we go about that and then the question of, uh, I do feel a lot of, uh, I mean, I think we all expressed that when we, we talked about who gets to make the decision. Um, it, we, uh, the, the amount of water and who controls it and, and how we uh, handle the future mm -hmm. demand is, is a big issue for, and a responsibility uh, for us. So uh, just putting mm -hmm. all that out there it doesn't take us, make, take us very far, but I think it's a really complex thing. I've got in the second round, uh, Mike, Alan, George, and Chris. Mike. Appreciate what the mayor said. I find myself agreeing with Chris and with George in a lot of what they said. Um, from my perspective, <clears throat> when your neighbor's house is on fire, you don't deny them the use of your garden hose. You know, um, Benita's in a position of uh, of real need at this moment, and I, like I said, look at it as as I think more like. George and Chris have to say, okay, what are the pros and cons of us doing what we can to be of help? And from my perspective, I, I can't see the downsides as well, although I recognize the more complex conversation that it involves. But I see us as benefiting on more fronts than just the one we've discussed so far of perfecting the water right. I think that's important and we don't know what the future brings mm -hmm. and when we're growing in Eugene as we are, are being told we're, we're planning to, um, we don't know what our need will be and as we get denser we're going to have a greater need. Um, along with that comes something that I've been speaking to a lot over time the issues of infrastructure and I, I had the opportunity to, to talk with Brenda recently and, and learn quite a bit about the fact that there are other folks, there are other people, there are other interested parties who are watching what we do that affect um, how we operate Eugene. One of those as I brought up in the first round is around bond rating. Now different from Vanita, Eugene has a very high degree of need to have a very good bond rating and we're proud of what we have. Um, that's something where, you know, when we're fixing the roads and borrowing money to do things that we do, we count on the fact that our good bond rating saves us a great deal of money. Well, there are rating agencies that look and say, do you have enough appropriate water supply for what you're planning long term and other infrastructure issues? And that affects what it costs us to borrow money to do some of the things we do. And, and I would like to see us perfecting more of our water right for the sake of maintaining our infrastructure at, at its optimum level and maintaining our bond rating and costing our taxpayers less. So for me this has a lot of pluses to it. 
Um, I understand the larger con conversation, um, but I don't see a lot of negatives to it at this moment. Alan? Well, I don't, I don't agree with your analogy. Vinita's house isn't on fire right now. They're worried about their house being on fire 20 years from now. Um, they do have actually enough supply to meet their existing demand. Um, it's really about their growth and how what's the limits of that and how far is Benita going to be able to, to grow within within their urban growth boundaries. But that's a completely different issue for me. Um, what, what's important to me, uh, besides our own growth management policies, is how uh, goal two impacts this conversation. And goal two in the land use laws re, re, uh, talks about coordinated regional planning. And um, right now we have no regional water plan. Um, there's no master plan that addresses EWEB as a regional water provider um, and, and how and, and, and looks at the city's role in that. Um, and uh, the focus has been on perfecting these water rights and, and, and perfecting our third water right in particular without a plan. Um, the Veneta deal gets, we're at what, 23%? of the water right and the Veneta deal gets us a little further towards the 25% and the 25% is the magic number because at that point then you you get a reservation on the next 25% so that's kind of what we're talking about to get to that 25% we need several Venetas in order to pull this off uh, there is no plan for actually how to do that and um, uh, um, but a master plan would address that issue how do we do it who does it is it consistent with our land use laws? And is it a good idea? And, and, and have a conversation about that. I asked Roger Gray at the, at the large customer breakfast meeting um, if, if EWEB had a master plan or they were planning to do a master plan. And he said that there was no master plan in progress and they didn't have any real plans to do that. I'm wondering, Deb, if you can address that issue and, and, and tell us if EWEB is committed to do a, a, a water master plan that involves the city and the community at large and has the conversations that George was talking about that I've been talking about and, and about all these different issues. I'll start and then Brad can jump in. First well, we do have a water master plan, and I know, and I know it, we're talking semantics, but we do have a requirement to do a long-term plan. And when did we complete our last? Um, right. So we do do, uh, and it's a 10-year view. There we go. And so we do have that. It deals primarily, though, as you're pointing out, with our community and with the infrastructure build-out needs to support growth. But I would point out that, you know. Part of our ongoing interest in the regional conversation has been around where will growth happen in Eugene, where will growth happen in, in, in and around Eugene, and that's a direct input to that master planning process. So what we've not done, and I think what you, the, the conversation you and Roger had, is a master plan that looks at a regional view in that same right. um, asset-based based approach. Um, right. And you're absolutely right. Um, Roger and I talked about it a little bit this week, and Brad and I have not had an opportunity to talk about it, so you can jump in on it. I think you, you know, I certainly can understand from your perspective, too, personally, you know, you, you obviously we, we know that we do long-term energy supply planning that's community-based and looks at regional supplies, et cetera. It is certainly a much more integrated view. And, and there's a logical thing perhaps around doing that on the water side. Brad, do you want to jump in? Yeah, sure. I, it obviously makes sense to do a, a more comprehensive uh, master plan as it relates to regionalization. Uh, I would just point out that um, the plan to this point uh, was aimed at um, several things. One, getting the dialogue started, which I think we actually started with the mayor in 2005. Um, and then following that, the critical issue of, you know, who, who's, wh where does the responsibility lie in terms of that planning as it relates to the authority question? Uh, and, you know, that's being worked out and resolved. And that's critical in terms of just getting to the place to have the discussion around um, the, that planning effort. Um, also on that planning effort, I, I don't personally think that um, EWEB starting off and doing a master plan for the region is the appropriate way to have the regional dialogue around the issue. And um, my approach since coming to EWEB has been that you know, for, it first starts with an awareness or an understanding and or an appreciation for what what is happening within our region. And that starts with one-on-one -on -one dialogues with the individual cities, which we've, we've had. Uh, with Rick and, and other city administrators. And that dialogue and that awareness actually spun out of the Region 2050 process that um, 
the council um, before you, um, um, you know, stopped it moving forward. And that dis from that discussion, um, it was obvious that there was a need to have a regional plan around just the water piece of all of the questions that were brought up in that planning context. Um, all of the communities were at the table at that point, and it was recognized at that point that eWeb could be a potential opportunity to to bring into that planning dialogue. Uh, as a result of that, all the all the satellite communities, Coburg, um, Cresswell, Junction City, Bonita, um, all those communities identified within their, their individual master plans that, that eWeb could be a potential source for water, water supply in the long term. That's the start. That's the foundation of the planning effort that then leads to this more collaborative approach around planning the future for the regional water provision. Um, this Bonita thing has gone way faster than any one of us would have thought, including, you know, Bonita staff. Um, and um, at, and we were in a position of we're trying to help Bonita out the best that we can, given that it's taken a long time just to get the trust dialogue to the point uh, that it is today to be able to enter into a 40-year contract and to deal with all the terms associated with that. And all that takes time. And it had to happen ahead of this, the plan that uh, Alan is making reference to that we all think, you know, obviously that needs to be in place. But So that was sort of a long answer, but um, hmm. that would be my, my take. So I, I understand you guys are, have a local master plan for water. I've, I've, I've looked at it, and it brought up the issue of the second source, which is should right. be what keeps everybody up at, at night, uh, mm -hmm. given we only get our water from the McKenzie. Um, so the local water plan is a good thing. But what I'm talking about is that regional water plan. And uh, I, I couldn't disagree with more strongly that we do actually exactly need to do a master water plan, and eWeb needs to lead it. You're the water provider. It, right now, our approach is that we don't have a plan, so we do these one-off haphazard planning where we go out and we do Vanita with no context about it. Next one is going to be, you know, Crestwell or Junction City or whatever, and we're going to have no context about that. And, and so what I gathered from your, your answer to my direct question, which was are you going to do a, a master plan, was no. No, that, I, I don't think that's true. I think what... what so are you guys committed to doing a master plan? Yes, I believe we are committed to in doing a master plan. I don't think we do not, years. not in the next 50 years. I can't tell you that I have it on or that Brad has it on his work plan. You know, one of the things that we are actively responding to right now is new leadership ourselves and what that means in terms of the priorities and how we work issues forward. And so, you know, to Brad's point, Brad's been, I, I didn't hear Brad say um, no. What I heard Brad say was, in his mind, developing those relationships was a critical first step in being able to go in then and ultimately partner with folks to develop a plan. And that's what he's been focusing on, is developing the relationships. And we all agree on that the Vanita situation got out in front of all of us. It, and, and it was driven by externalities, and, and here we are. But I, I don't think we disagree with you at all. I know we don't disagree with you at all. Ellen, do you want a third round? Well, sure. again, you know, you had that conversation with Roger, and he and I had it yesterday. So uh, I'm not saying that it might not be in our work plan next week, but I'm saying that, you know, right now we're processing real time. Okay. George Brown. Thanks. Yeah, these, these one-off things. I mean, what's going to happen next week? Is, are we, is Creswell going to come to us and say, hey, you know, we want to double our population in 20 years, and well, we can't, so we really need to. We've got these prime development lots ready to go, and the only way we can do it is with e-web with e water. Um, I don't know. I, I'm not saying I'm, I'm going to vote against this, but, I, but it's just like the way that it's been presented and and, and at this time, when we're doing Envision Eugene and we're talking about expanding our growth boundary, here we are talking about basically creating a subdivision, but it's not even in our urban growth boundary, much less in our city limits. It's 10 miles away. And, and really, I don't think that they could grow, they could double their population like is the projection without this water. And there's going to be other communities that are in the same position. And so and if we do it like... Hey, just you know, wh whoever walks up to the door, without a without a regional plan, or whether we want to do regional planning, I don't know. That's we need to decide whether we want to do that. Um, 
it just kind of goes, you know, we have these conversations about sustainability and transportation and carbon footprint and everything, and yet here we are encouraging, this is way suburban growth. This is like ex-urban growth, way out of the urban growth boundary, way out of, but what do we get for it? We don't even, we don't get property taxes for it. We get nothing for the, you know, there's 1,800 people a day that probably drive in from Vanita, and if when they double their population, that'll be 3,600. But, you know, it just, that's, that's a problem for me. And that's just Vanita. So, I, I don't know. It just seems like, you know, we say we have these goals. We say we have these goals, and then we turn around and do something that directly contradicts the goals. It's like we do that from time to time. And I think this is perhaps one of those cases without an overarching plan just to, to do these things one at a time. I'm not so sure that that's the way to go. Thank you. I just would, uh, pressure next, but I'll make the, just a comment here that um, sometimes we have um, good goals that, I say this a lot, that bump into each other. So um, I think in terms of what I heard Rick say is their desire is to build a community where people can live, work, and play mm -hmm. at home mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. um, and to build up more localization of all of those things in in their community, so they're striving to do what um, we would say that we, we're striving to do, mm -hmm. and uh, and I realize the other thing that George brought up is really true too that we do we have a a, a travel um, area um, that is shared and that has its uh, its costs and stuff too. So um, I just uh, sometimes those good good purposes do run into each other and then we get the wonderful uh, world of trying to figure out what's in the best interest of our community and and of our larger um, region from our perspective. Did you want to say something? I see your voice there. Well, just, uh, I mean, and I think you've probably heard me say this in the past, I mean, we, we are a community, and maybe not different than many other rural communities uh, in Oregon, where once you've lost your timber industry base, you know, we actually have fewer businesses operating in Benita than we did 20 years ago. So uh, as every other business declines, we have more dollars leaving the community that is then harder for us to try to capture that well, try to capture those dollars in our community and help build jobs. And so, you know, a big part of our focus is to, you know, go ahead and rebuild that business space. And uh, not that this, this is a crucial piece of it, but we do need to meet that 20-year build-out. And I think, you know, at some point, um, Communities are defined, and at some point you're going to be viewed as a community totally in decline, and businesses and industries are not going to look to you, and you basically say, we're going to live with every two years we're going to shut down another school, and pretty soon there will be no heart and soul, there won't be a community there. And then I think you're basically left with, do you unincorporate? Do you choose no longer to be a truly incorporated, active, vibrant community? And our s elected officials are saying, no, there is a good heart and soul to that community, and we're going to work hard to keep it vibrant and vital. And um, and there's a, it's a hard road to, 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 to move down, but that's what we need to be doing. Okay, I've got Chris and George Poling in this round. Chris? Thanks. Uh, this is a c obviously a complex discussion, and it would be nice if we could deal with Vinny just as an isolated discussion and not have to deal with the larger with the larger issues but I can see how that really is not entirely possible to do because you are representative of what these larger issues are and I I'm glad we have gotten onto the table the conversation about what is Eugene's role in the larger region if it's going to be a partnership role what does partnership look like um, how far does it extend and what kinds of things does it involve if it's going to be a manager role where we, dis where we, through our resources or control of our resources, can limit, restrict, stop, whatever, um, growth or development or other kinds of things. What is that role? What does that look like? And um, I don't have an answer to that because I, I know we are definitely a factor in the region, but I don't know the degree to which we should be a controller in the region or that what we want should control other areas. Um, on the other hand, we, we do have the resources and we need to be good stewards of those resources and we need to allocate them in, a, in an appropriate way. But um, I tend to come from the, the stand that, you know, we're kind of all in this together. It's kind of the more um, collaborative kind of sense of things is that if we have a resource and it's available and it's not hurting us, if we can make that resource available, 
um, why wouldn't we want to do that as, as being a good partner? And is it really our job to manage your growth because of what we think it ought to be? Which gets into the question of these growth management policies up here. And, I, and it's been mentioned a couple of times that these are the growth management policies. And I'll be candid. Why should I buy into those? They were adopted in February of 1998. I didn't have any participation in <laughs> those. Take it off the wall. Huh? Let's take it off the wall. You know, that's a really good point. I that second really that. Point. We, we talked about <laughs> our, uh, this stuff because I, it was good. We should probably talk about that stuff. There's some in there that I might even see contradict each other. And so I'm not saying they're bad, but I want to have a chance to weigh in on them before we start using them to govern real-world kinds of things. And so... You know what, I absolutely agree there should be a master plan. There really should be a master plan because this is very critical, very important stuff that affects us all mm -hmm. and needs to be in place. If there is a way to be able to accommodate what was an unforeseen but immediate issue that, needs, that, that should be dealt with, we still should be moving with all deliberate speed toward a plan that not only talks about water but talks about a whole variety of things in this area because it really this is a conversation that needs to take place and I'm not wedded to these I'm wedded to something that really is practical and works and and can really be cl clarify to all of us where we want to go collectively so um, that's the long way around but I I'd like to be able to give you certainty but uh, and to the degree we can I want to but I recognize all the larger issues that are being talked about here and they do have to be talked about Okay, George Poling, you're next. Well, I have to kind of agree with what Chris, Chris's comments about us being the controller. I mean, we do have these 1998 rules that we go by, and until such time they're updated, we should go by them. However, I don't think we should be dictating to other cities what they do. If they want to, if they want to expand or grow rather in a certain way, you know that's that's up to them to set those their policies and their growth management plan and everything else of that nature. Uh, the mayor had a, made a very good point. Sometimes we do have some goals that bump into each other, and we just have to kind of take that into consideration and try to figure out what's best for everybody involved, not just us. Eugene is not the center of the world, folks. It's, <laughs> it's just oh, come on, it's George. just Eugene. <laughs> we are the world's greatest city, though. That aren't probably we? is not going to make very many people happy, <laughs> but that's you know, that? we are not the center of the universe. We need to work with all of our all of our partners within our within the big the larger community. Uh, and you know, I have a conversation on a daily basis with one of the leading economic development experts in this area, and one of the problems with mm -hmm. the need of building within itself is the fact that. Their water sources right now. Uh, there's been contacts made with various companies, and, and uh, you know that's that's a big drawback to trying to get somebody to to develop, help develop Vanita into more than just a, as George says, as a bedroom community. So we do need to do something to help them, and you know this is one step forward. And you know I just want to say one last thing. I appreciate Alan and George's honesty in mm -hmm. labeling this a growth issue and not protecting the water source because when this first came up most of the proponents were saying oh it's all about pr protecting the water and 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 uh, you know not drawing all the water off of our off the rivers and stuff this issue is not about the water anymore it's about growth management not only within Eugene but within the entire Lane County area and these two gentlemen are the only ones that are in my opinion they're actually being honest about it and I appreciate that I may not agree with them but at least I appreciate the fact mm -hmm. that they're going to be honest in their opinions okay third round Alan <laughs> so just to reemphasize this isn't about Vanita um, it's a blessing and a curse to go first. <laughs> Sorry about that. You just it's happened right. to be there, <laughs> Rick. Good, good, good for you. Uh, and this isn't about control. This is about adherence to our adopted policies and the land use laws. It's not about whether or not we decide. We have these adopted policies. Do we adhere to them or not? If we're not going to do that, let's either change them or take them off the wall. I asked a, a year and a half ago for an analysis of what one of those have been codified and which ones we adhere to and how we adhere to them. I never saw any of that. So, uh, 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 and I'm not <laughs> about controlling what Vinita does. Vinita does whatever they want to do. I'm about what happens to us with regard to our policies and the land use laws and whether or not we're consistent with them. Uh, I'm not a no growther at all. I am a smart or planned growther. I think that we have these policies and land use laws for a reason. 
not to nod and wink at them, but to actually adhere to them. And if we're not going to adhere to them, we should try to change them or to say that we're not and have an exception to them. So with that, I have two, two specific, uh, three specific questions, one for city manager and two for EWEB. Can we get a consistency analysis of our, our growth management policies and this more regional water provision thing, not just specifically at Venita, especially policies one, two, five, and ten, and how it relates to our land use laws and how whether or not we're consistent, specifically uh, goal 11, 14, and two. And um, and then for EWEB, I, I still don't know what the plan is to perfect the 25%. Um, do we have a plan? If you could, could you explain it to us? And um, and what is your time frame? Are, are you going to do a regional master water plan? And in, if so, in what time frame? And you don't have to answer those now. You can get them. Good. I'd actually like to do that. Well, I'd like to. I don't want to. I don't want to sit here and yeah. I, I want to think about it. I want to go back and talk to Tom Buckhouse, who's the director of the water utility, and say what's his timing. What what would he see as an appropriate time frame to complete that work, and how can he resource it? And I would say, you know, the answer to your first question is obviously related to to the answer to your second, because what we're talking about, again, if you go back to the drawing that others in this room saw that had um, a potential regional relationship with other utilities for backup water purposes, if we have a commitment around providing backup supply from other larger neighboring utilities, that backup commitment does count towards um, our ability to reserve the 25 percent and the next 25 percent. So suddenly it becomes a whole lot easier and it isn't necessarily through direct service, it's through a reciprocal relationship around um, second source. And that, you know, that is the, the that is the, the very logical path forward and that's what, again why we say that our ability to deal respectfully and to manage all these issues that you folks are raising around consistency to principle and process while at the same time honoring uh, a small city's right to plan themselves, that balance is something that's really important, um, I think will be really important to other communities who are watching this process. Right. In, in a regional water master plan to me would address issues of second exactly. source. It would address l looking to Springfield Utility Board Water Division as a backup source. And, and, and that's what a, a regional master water plan would have in it. And it would address all these other issues about how you secure that 25% and whether or not Junction City, Crestwell, whoever is, you know, the next ones, the next Vanitas who get to s sit where you are, Rick. <laughs> they're all hoping that yeah, they don't hoping. have to. <laughs> yeah, that's all. that's right. That's just so, and, and then we have all these. We have the issues of the the lawsuits that are moving forward as well. You wanted to speak. I'd just like to add a couple of things to that too, and I, I tried to make it on the, the first time I articulated it, but um, you know, there's there's steps, there's bits and pieces of a plan um, that has moved forward, and, and where I'm struggling with in hearing this conversation, Alan, and. and, and you know, going forth and doing a plan is there. There was one of these. There was a regional master mm -hmm. plan done. It was it was 1967, uh, and actually that that plan was done by ELCOG, and it was coordinated through the link. You know that 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 functional unit that did that plan. Um, then the metro plan came forward, and once the metro plan came forward, the broader master plan vision died away in, in the history. It, it got sort of shelved, and we went more on the metro plan view that just looked at the, the Eugene Springfield areas. Um, so there, there is a plan out there that start, that looked at these broader regional issues. You know, that was done in 1967. Yeah, it, it obviously needs updating. But the <laughs> other point that I wanted to add to that is, is that um, I would not suggest that EWEB go forward and plan mm -hmm. it in the, in the approach that you're alluding to, which is. EWEB go forth and do a master plan. Um, we live in a, a place where it's very parochial, <laughs> and uh, EWEB will not be successful if we approach it uh, from that view. And uh, it, it, it takes a more iterative process to get comfortable with communities and understand where they are in their planning process, uh, and then try to align that into some type of regional strategy you know, view or plan. Uh, and so I would advocate we need to move, move down the path, but I would uh, offer out that, yeah, eWeb can lead it, 
but we would hope that it would be a much more collaborative approach where we would be combining the needs of, of, of other communities uh, into that perspective. Um, EWEB can't write the plan for Venita, and we haven't done that in our relationship with Venita to this point. Uh, and nor do we, you know, we nor do we want to. So anyway, and I, but I do ag agree entirely that it needs to be a plan, but perhaps maybe a different view of how it needs to be done. Well, I agree that a regional plan needs to involve the regional players, and right. and uh, it takes a long time, so you need to start sooner than later. Um, can we get a consistency? Findings about those different our growth management policies and the land use laws. Uh, yeah, we'll put something together that tries to match those together huh. and provide some huh. additional information for you. Huh. Yeah, I uh, before I call in Mike and then we'll be wrapping it up. Um, I just say this takes us all the way back to the beginning of the conversation about oversight of water rights because if we really circle all the way back around and we end up prevailing on that, then. I believe that thing is in our pocket, so just want to make that um, mm -hmm. that comment. <laughs> but we don't know that yet. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say is uh, our growth management policies are our growth management policies until a majority of the council says we want to readdress them. And uh, and uh, if you want to examine what we done, not in this particular context, but in a general context, what we've done or not done with our growth management policies, then that also is a decision of the whole body to ask staff to do that because that's a sizable um, that's a sizable job, and so they wouldn't be heading off doing that if that wasn't the will of uh, the majority of of council to do that. I, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Hmm. I'm just saying. A little bit more. I'm <laughs> just saying. Are we going to get a planning director? I mean, something like that. Somebody screaming into the night. Big deal. Yes. Okay. So, Mike, you want to wrap it up? Well, I was just going to say to, to the mayor's point. Um, for those concerned about regional growth, I would say, to the larger degree that Eugene has. Um, control of more and more water rights on the Mackenzie, we have more and more stake in the conversation about regional growth. And so it's a reason to perfect them for those who are concerned about that. But I really appreciate what was said here and what Chris said and, and George as well, but I think you, you really summed up a lot of what I was thinking that how we deal with this is important. I, I think over the last few years we've seen a couple models of uh, regional cooperation that that work and a couple that don't um, I think we've seen some issues addressed even at this council table in different ways over the last couple of years in ways that that work in ways that don't because um, there are a lot of diverse interests in our area but the stuff we've got to face not just water rights but the transportation issues that we have to face and the economic development issues that we have to face over the next few years are going to require that we do well at it on a regional basis. And I, for one, would like to see us doing a better job of cooperating with our regional partners and working well with them. Um, I was sad to see the 2050 process fall apart, but I think a part of that can be laid at the doorstep of too much squabbling about different interests and not enough focus on best outcomes for the entire region. I mean, to, it's easy to see to the degree that Venita has the capacity to provide their own industry and their own employment base and their own jobs because they have the water to do it, decreases how many people from Venita are driving to Eugene every day and decreases our need to invest more in transportation between those communities. So I, I think that I'd really like to see us focusing less on, on how we restrict uh, our neighbors and our partners in the region, and more on how well we can work together towards a, a better mutual end. I'd just like to, a couple seconds of comment here, that I just want to honor both things. I want to honor that we want to work with our regional partners and that we care about them and their future just as we care about our own. But I also want to recognize that we have our own um, policies and our own things that, in, that we are trying to achieve and that, we, um, that sometimes those do come into conflict with others and that is just an, that is the nature of things too. So uh, I want to honor both the respect and respect for working together and respect for differences because they do exist and they are all part of, of who we are.